These stories from the Appalachian Trail are too creepy and horrifying. Ghosts, wilderness survival, and cold-blooded murder. These stories have it all. So gather around the campfire for some spooky tales of the Appalachian Trail. Our first story begins around August of 2019 when Brad Lane sets out for a solo backpacking trip on the Appalachian Trail. He has a week off of work, so decides to hike a section of the trail and de-stress enjoying the great outdoors. Brad decides to start his trip at the trailhead near Catawba, Virginia. This is the first time Brad has solo backpack in years as he typically prefers to go with a companion or a group. And it doesn't take long for Brad to remember why. The trail is eerily quiet while traveling alone and every random sound makes him look over his shoulder. From the very start, something felt off and Brad was very anxious. The first night of Brad's trip and he finds a spot to set up camp, makes dinner and crashes in his tent. Even though he's exhausted, Brad struggles to fall asleep. He tosses and turns late into the night and wakes up the next morning even more tired than he was before. As tired as he is, Brad packs up and hits the trail. He makes it about five miles down the trail before the setting sun forces him to stop and set up camp again. This time, Brad is so worn out that instead of preparing his dinner, he resorts to just eating a pack of raw ramen noodles in his tent. I'm not even sure how you eat raw ramen noodles, but if Brad is settling for this for dinner, he must be seriously tired. After this flavorless, extremely crunchy meal, Brad falls into a restless sleep. At some point in the night, Brad is half asleep when he's suddenly fully awakened by a horrifying sound. Footsteps. Brad hears the distinct sound of footsteps and rustling of leaves coming right from outside his tent. But what's even scarier is the footsteps were accompanied by a deep, grumbling, agitated voice. Now Brad can't distinguish any actual words, but he's sure he hears this sound. With no choice but to stay silent in his tent and make it through the night, Brad tries his best to convince himself that his ears are just playing tricks on him. The next day, Brad forces himself to get up and continue down the Appalachian Trail. Now off to an extremely late start, he doesn't make it far before it's time to set up camp once again. Brad makes a fire and tries to relax for the evening. The fire's glow puts him at ease and he settles in to have a cigarette and chill out. Feeling better as he finishes his cigarette, Brad gets up and tends to the fire. But when he turns round to go back to his seat, what he sees through the flames shocks him so badly that he falls backward into the dirt. There is a man standing right in front of him. The man wears a red plaid shirt that is singed with large black burn marks. He reaches down toward Brad's pile of firewood with a scorched smoking hand. The man looks up at Brad with vacant white eyes, then grits his teeth and walks out of the firelight and into the darkness. Completely stunned by his fear, Brad had no idea what to do. Before he can even process what just happened, he grabs all of his belongings and stumbles back onto the trail in the middle of the night. Or at least, he hopes it's the trail. Brad is so freaked out that he takes off without a clue on where he's going. He wanders around in the dark for hours, trying to put some distance between him and whatever he just saw at his campsite. When dawn finally breaks, Brad is relieved to be able to see clearly again and makes his way towards signs of civilization. He reaches an empty open pasture and sets up his tent there. Hungry and exhausted, he eats some of his cheese and salami and then passes out for a daytime nap right in the grassy field. Now that's my idea of a vacation. This, to be honest, sounds like the best part of Brad's trip. But that doesn't last long. Brad is startled awake by a strange smell. He quickly realizes the smell is burning plastic and is coming from what's left of his tent. Brad's tent has burned to the ground and is now just a bubbly pile of melted green plastic with grey smoke rising around it. Brad can't believe what he's seeing right before his eyes. Especially because he never built a fire at this campsite. Without thinking twice, Brad grabs whatever he can and just takes off running through the empty pasture. Scared for his life, Brad sprints as fast as he can and is relieved to see a gravel road up ahead. He's even more relieved when he sees a sheriff's sedan just down the road. As he approaches, he realizes the sheriff's vehicle is parked outside of the charred remains of a house that appears to have recently burned down. 
Brad asks the officer for a ride back into town, but doesn't mention the terrifying encounters he had in the past couple of days. Instead, he asks the officer about the house that burned down. The officer explains that the very same day that Brad started his trip, the house was burnt to the ground and arson was suspected. A man, woman, and two daughters were all in the house when the fire was started. None of them made it out alive. Absolutely shocked, Brad realizes that the frightening events he experienced on the Appalachian Trail could have been paranormal, and that he could have locked eyes with an actual ghost. Brad has said to this day he has never been so scared as he was the night he saw the man with the scorched hand. Ugh, just thinking of that sends shivers down my spine so I can't even imagine the blood-curdling fear that Brad must have felt. Whether what he saw was real or not, I'm just glad he made it out safely. Our next Appalachian story focuses on Geraldine Laguet. The 66-year-old retired nurse started hiking the Appalachian Trail in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia on April 23rd, 2013. She and her friend Jane Lee planned to tackle the trail together and the two started their hike traveling north towards Maine. By June 30th, the pair had only reached New Hampshire when Jane receives word of a family emergency. She has to cut the hike short and leave the trail immediately. Jane tries to get Geraldine to leave with her, but she insists on pressing on alone. Geraldine continues down the Appalachian Trail for close to a month, and she seemed to be doing okay on her own. That is until the morning of July 22nd, when suddenly things take a turn for the absolute worst. Now in western Maine, less than 200 miles from the end of the trail, Geraldine has made slow and steady progress. On July 22nd, around 11 a.m., she pauses her hike and walks off of the trial, likely to go to the bathroom. But when she turns around to head back, she isn't sure which way to go. Geraldine seems to be disorientated and struggles to find her way back to the trail. Realizing she's in a bad situation, Geraldine texted her husband, saying, In some trouble, got off trail to go to BR, now lost. She also asks him to call the Appalachian Mountain Club to send someone to find her. Geraldine tries her best to make it out and keeps trying to send messages. But she has no cell service in the deep forest, so no messages are going through. So she resorts to making the camp and waiting to be rescued. A couple days later, when she misses her scheduled meetup with her husband at a checkpoint, he reports her missing. A search and rescue mission to find Geraldine begins. One simple mistake and she's lost in the deep woods with no way to call for help. Geraldine continues to wait at her camp and seems to make efforts to attract attention. A reflective silver space blanket tied between two trees as well as burn marks on the trees near her campsite indicate that she tried to send signals to make her location apparent to rescuers. But sadly, Geraldine's efforts don't pay off. The days she waits to be rescued turn to weeks and she tracks the passing time in a journal she kept while traveling the trail. Despite rescuers' best attempts, the forest that Geraldine is lost in is extremely dense and rugged, making it impossible for them to find her. She manages to survive at her camp alone for almost a month until she eventually realizes her tragic fate. In her chilling final journal entry, Geraldine writes, When you find my body, please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me no matter how many years from now. And unfortunately, it would be another two years until Geraldine's body was found. On October 14th, 2015, a logging company surveyor came across her campsite and her remains. This solved the mystery of Geraldine's disappearance and marked the end of her Appalachian Trail story. My heart truly goes out to Geraldine's family. It must have been so hard not to know what had happened to her that entire time only to receive this tragic news. Geraldine was truly incredible for making it that far on the trail and surviving as long as she did. The two hikers in our next story encounter a different kind of danger on the Appalachian Trail. Molly LaRue and Jeffrey Logan Hood were both in their mid-twenties when they set out on the Appalachian Trail in June of 1990. The young lovers met when they both worked at a church-sponsored camp for at-risk youth and were known for being really good people with the desire to help those in need. They were both avid hikers and wanted to hike the entire length of the Appalachian Trail together, traveling south from Maine to Georgia. 
so Molly and Jeffrey set out to tackle the trail. The beginning of the trip seemed to go smoothly, with Molly writing funny notes in logbooks at the shelters they stayed at along the way. By September, the couple had reached their midpoint of their journey near Duncannon, Pennsylvania. They restock their supplies in town and then head back to the trail to spend the night. This is when Molly and Jeffrey's dream of hiking the Appalachian Trail turns into a nightmare. Back on the trail, the couple stop at the Thelma Mark Shelter, a small lean-to shelter for hikers to sleep in. Molly and Jeffrey make camp there and settle in to sleep before another day on the trail. But the next day, another pair of hikers arriving at the shelter discover a gruesome scene. Molly and Jeffrey were horrifically killed in the night. Their bodies are now strewn across the wooden floors of the shelter with blood everywhere. Police are called to the scene and they find several stab wounds to Molly's body and multiple gunshots to Jeffrey's. A manhunt is quickly underway and warnings to hikers are put out as authorities try to track down the perpetrator of this vicious crime. Hikers report spotting a suspicious man in the vicinity of the murders. The man stood out because he didn't carry his backpack the way an experienced hiker would and wasn't dressed in the appropriate gear for hiking the trail. After a week of the brutal killings, the police are finally able to track down this man. His name is Paul David Cruz and when authorities find him, he is in possession of some of Molly and Jeffrey's belongings as well as both murder weapons. Cruz was put on trial for both the murders of Molly LaRue and Jeffrey Logan Hood and it was found that he had a long history of anger issues, substance abuse, and mental health issues. Cruz was found guilty based on forensic and circumstantial evidence and was sentenced to death for his crimes. However, he later appealed this and received two consecutive life sentences instead of the death penalty. Throughout all of his years in prison, Cruz never explained why he murdered Molly LaRue and Jeffrey Logan Hood that night on the Appalachian Trail. This story just makes me so sad. It's awful that two kind-hearted, truly good people were senselessly murdered. This story is also a frightening reminder that sometimes the most dangerous thing you can encounter in the wilderness is another person. That's the last terrifying tale of the Appalachian Trail. I have to know what you think about these stories. Which of these three scenarios are you most afraid of? And have you ever had a scary encounter while hiking or camping? You know what to do, let's head to the comment section and get this conversation going. We'll be back with another store IRL, but until then, stay curious about the stories around you in the world. I'm MJC Matthew, and this has been Store IRL.